We are here today to commemorate a video that represents Florida's 15th Congressional District in the National Local Legacies Project of the Library of Congress Bicentennial Celebration. Before I go any further, I want to thank the Economic Development Commission for taking the lead on this project and A Cut Above Video Productions for producing the video. They are the sponsors of this video and they deserve a warm round of applause. At the turn of the 20th century, this untamed stretch of Florida's eastern coastline was virtually untouched by the hand of man. Fishing shanties, cattle ranges, and citrus groves sparsely populated this scrubland infested with mosquitoes. Life was simple, slow, quiet. But perhaps every so often on a moonlit night, they looked up into the sky and wondered, what's really out there? As the 21st century dawns, rockets streak across the skies of Brevard County, and a new era of spaceflight continues. Who could have possibly imagined that its fate was written in the stars as early as 1865 by a French visionary across the Atlantic Ocean? Science fiction author Jules Verne, in his novel From Earth to the Moon, wrote of an imaginary moon rocket. Uh, Jules Verne cited uh, his uh, launch to the moon here in Florida. That's uh, very ironic. Uh, uh, could not, a holy coincidence, maybe, that we have Florida as a launch site uh, for the moon program, you know. Coincidence? Maybe. Or perhaps Jules Verne foresaw Florida's potential as a future moon port. The U.S. military made the same discovery almost a century later when it picked a sandy stretch of land sandwiched between the Atlantic Ocean and the Banana River to launch its missiles. It was a decision which would make Brevard the only county in the U.S. with a history of manned spaceflight. But what about the people who made the dream of spaceflight come true? Who were these early space pioneers? How did they get here? I was grew up in the days of Buck Rogers and uh, science fiction books because there really weren't any space programs. When I was in high school, I guess the Bay of Pigs was, was being conducted, and that kind of brought my attention to the, the space center here, which wasn't a space center. It was almost unknown at that point. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. I always had a, a dream of aviation or rocketry, and I always followed it low key until I saw that redstone go up with uh, Mr. Shepard in it. And that's it. That's where I'm going. I need to be there. I need to be part of that action. I was just fresh out of Georgia Tech. And I saw an ad for uh, rocket engineers at Huntsville. And the, the one interesting thing about this whole space business, in 1951 and in the early 50s, you didn't go out and hire a rocket engineer with 10 years, five years, 20 years experience. We were all young. So I got a, job, a letter from Convair saying, we just won the Atlas contract. I don't know what you're going to be doing, but it will be exciting. In the space race, uh, I remember the Sputnik going up. I was in the Navy at the time the Sputnik went up, and I remember thinking that we're really behind as Americans in this, this space race. At the very day that we crossed the line from Georgia into Florida, I heard on the radio that Werner Von Braun and General Medeiros, his boss, had just gotten up our first satellite. And I said, this is a harbinger of things to come for me and my school that I had been thinking about. Even if it was just a little beeping satellite, it meant something big. I didn't quite understand what it meant, but I wanted to be part of it. They are trailblazers to the stars, the heart and soul of America's space program. This is their story. Some are products of World War II. Others were influenced by childhood tales of space adventure, model rockets, toy spaceships, and outer space comic books. 
They are eyewitnesses to spectacular moments in 20th century history.